So again, autophagy is something we can't measure, but we have these great scientific papers that teach us about it. We have some unbelievable breakthroughs in the last two years teaching us about it. Uh, we just have estimates about how we think a body, most people would be able to predict whether or not they have autophagy. Um, the first thing that is you can't have uh, robust autophagy when your insulin is high. Uh, again, I can't go check your insulin. I mean, I could check your insulin, but that would I mean you have to go to the lab and you, you can't have a you know big bowel movement ahead of time. There's all these rules that say if you want to know if their insulin what their insulin is doing, there's a whole bunch of rules. So we use your glucose and your blood ketones as a, an estimate of autophagy because you can't have really good ketones if your insulin's high. And if your insulin's high, your sugar's not gonna be, your sugar's gonna be, if your insulin's high, usually that happens when your sugar's high. So when you get these nice sugars below 100 and you get the ketones creeping up above one and a half, you get some really good ratios. And that is how we estimate our chances of being in autophagy. Well, let's back up a second and say, when I have a cancer patient, and I am working to say, how can I put the greatest amount of stress on those cancer cells, uh, and but still let the body flourish and be revived, if you would, with the fuel of a ketone? I want their ratio to be 20 or less. And in that ratio of 20 or less, um, we can have a really high confidence that they are in autophagy. But it's hard. It's harder than snot to get them there. I mean. My, my mom, during her cancer treatment, she fasted for nearly 40 days with one-fourth of a cup of bone broth a day. And she was already on a ketogenic diet, thank goodness, but she, we, didn't, we didn't reach this ratio maybe three, three days out of that 40. Uh, and we ended up having to do some supplements with exogenous ketones to really get her over the threshold to keep that ratio um, correct. So that's really hard. So if you, if you can get the ratio of 40 or less, I'm still quite confident that you're having a, a, a good percentage of the time with autophagy ignited. When you're 80 or less and you're doing ketogenic the other times, you still have some pretty good chances that autophagy is happening. It's just more flicker on and off. But the life that comes with 80 is so much more tolerable yeah. I mean, you got busy people doing this, kids, you know, there's, if you want to set them up for success, we put a goal up there to say, we're not going to die if we don't get there. But if we get there, I think you're going to get plenty of benefit by flickering that autophagy on and off in the times where, um, you know, we do push your body or, 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 or reach for a little higher number. But at least getting to 80, we get that on and off kind of sputter autophagy, if you would. Becky, she says, how many days of water fasting until autophagy kicks in? And so, yeah, that's a good question. Um, autophagy, again, uh, been a really fun thing to, wa to, to watch in the science literature. Uh, again, it's a microcellular process of cleaning up debris. Uh, I talk about this when it comes to brains and the rust not really rust, but it's a good thing to think, display the imagery, the rust that happens in our brains when we don't sleep well and we have um, chronic inflammation. This uh, process leads to a Parkinsonian type behavior, Alzheimer's type behavior. So the data to say, what's the answer to that question? It's, it's done in people who, it's done in animals uh, that are um, on a carb type diet. And when they are fasted, it takes them at least 72 hours to get to autophagy. However, they think that when you're already in a ketogenic state, and this is one of those places where I don't, I don't rec recommend most of my patients go out and start checking their blood sugars and blood ketones when they're on a ketogenic diet. I tell them, start with urine ketone strips. Don't waste your money. Just get in the rhythm of eating keto. But when you take two folks like you, we've been doing keto for a couple of years. We're kind of stuck. I'm going to push you check your numbers. And when you are chemically in ketosis, you can see those ketones are being made. You can see most of those sugars are under 100 or, you know, pray that they're under 110 real ratios where it's 80 or less. If they're in that range of 80 or less with their ratios, you can see autophagy is estimated that it could begin as quickly as 12 hours. 
And so that's why when you say, can I, can I go for 48 hour fast this next week on week two? Uh, the couple things that I, uh, when, you, when you coach somebody about behavior changes, uh, the two things that are really powerful are uh, capture success of several days in a row and don't push them to failure before their, their legs are stable. So it, it brings me back to saying, tell me when you did that 24 hour fast and you got up to that 22 hour fast and Jennifer said, have this little meal of gooey stuff before you have the real meal. Um, how did that go? Did you have any troubles after you started to eat 24 hours in? I actually, I didn't feel as good after I ate. I felt I had right. less energy and I assumed, well, it was a long day, you know, um, we, uh, we worked 10 hour shifts. So, um, but yeah, I remember, I remember thinking after I ate, I'm like, I liked it better when I wasn't eating, you know, I felt better, mm -hmm. had more energy, but it was the end of the day and I'm sure my body had to digest the food. So that might've been it. Right. Well, I'll tell you the hardest day of the fast is the first one. And so it's where you say it's this tipping point to say, if you can push it to a 36 hour fast, um, I, I, I like people to see how that feels. And then giving yourself permission that if you feel good at 36, we could go to 48. Um, when they have their first 24 hour fast and they get to that point where they're eating and they get the diarrhea, their body really doesn't feel good. They had a headache is why they ate. Uh, so not a story like I'm hearing from you. Uh, then I, I tell them, this is practice doing well at the 24 hour fast. You know, many times they just have to be a little better at the salt that they didn't do or did do. Um, sometimes they're adding fat, they're really not fasting, and so then it, it really kind of messes it up. It sounds like you were pretty solid on those, just really black coffee, water, salt, uh, iced tea, or tea is fine. Uh, but really sticking to that rule, um, and when they do that and they feel well, that gives me the, the signal that says, no, 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 I think they're making pretty good ketones, and your numbers suggest that. Your sugars didn't fluctuate a lot. Like, some patients I see their sugars go up to 140, then back down to 80, then up to 140. And, you know, their body is just trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Um, and, and they're insulin resistant. They're usually very insulin resistant. So in those people, I'm like, stop, stop pushing so hard. I know that if you could get to the second day of fasting, wait till you get to the third day of fasting. The, that's, those are fun. Cause I'll you're, give you a shot. Yeah, the ketones are like 3.5. Sometimes my ketones are 4.0. Um, I'm like, I get a lot of stuff done. <laughs> I mean, like my brain works so well. Uh, but uh, so I do a fast starting every Sunday. Uh, and when I start, it's always this kind of slump because the first day is the hardest. And so when you when you give me a report that says, you know, Doc, I did pretty well. Um, that, uh, the two things I would encourage you to do is to have on hand, um, a good bone broth that if you're doing well and you want to see if you can push it without hurting, you know, it's kind of like this kind of thread the needle. Can you do this? If you've got that pretty high glucosamine, um, kind of the, 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 bone broth made with chicken feet. I don't know if I've talked to you about this before. <clears throat> it's in the book, but uh, that chicken feet has uh, the supplement in it that's, uh, you can buy it in pills, but if you get bone broth, you only need a fourth of a cup and you want it really salty. And if you can do that, um, it's amazing how people say, oh, you broke your fast, you had that bone broth, but uh, you can't believe how much of that liquid salt um, and that, you know, glucose that that it's a it's a bone broth that gels so it, it sounds really kind of gross but it really tastes good especially if you're fasting and it's nice and warm that kind of just becomes almost the slime layer of your gut <laughs> i mean um I, I don't know if you got to the part in the book where my mom you know had to fast for over you know 30 days we thought we'd make it to 40 and she was having one fourth of bone broth per day and, you know, she was a mess. Uh, she had all kinds of things coming out the wrong orifices of her body and not fun and good grief. Uh, and we were, like, not telling anybody we were fasting. But in her bone broth, we put the, we put pepper. Uh, and so we had salted and put pepper and made it, you know, taste as good as you could possibly make this one-fourth of liquid she was getting to live off of. Um, and, um, yeah, what came out the other end was just specks of this pepper. And you're like, what? How could that be the only thing that comes out? But when you look at what the nourishment of that GI lining is, 
um, you're going to turn that into like the slime layer of what your gut naturally needs to protect itself. So it's incredibly healing. And I know people I've had, a, you know, I've been chirped at several times saying, oh, you broke your fast. I'm like, shush, <laughs> I'm doing really good here. <laughs> this is hard. And if I, you know, screwed up and had a little cream in my coffee or, you know, every, everybody gets to define their fast um, in a way that says, I mean, I've seen people do fast where they didn't have M&Ms for two days and that was a step in the right direction. And I celebrated with them <laughs> <laughs> because this was a big deal. So to have a 22 hour fast where you were super successful and I'm giving you this like hint saying, I think you'll be okay if you reach towards a 36 hour fast. Um, give yourself permission to have that fourth of a cup of bone broth if you get to a place where you don't quite feel as great, um, but you, you think you can make it, um, especially for the brain that has ADHD or that kind of scrambly brain that can get off and, you know, take care of a squirrel every third second. Uh, they are my favorite people to watch what happens when their ketones get up to 2.5 or 3. Their brain works like it's supposed to. It is, you are meant to be in this state more than we are. And when we live our whole lives with high sugars and no ketones, the people who suffer dramatically are these labels we've given to, you know, ADHD, which is probably all of us if our sugars spend up high that long. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I did grow up in the age where Captain Crunch was actually considered a breakfast. Please subscribe to my channel and don't forget to click the notification bell so you don't miss out on any new videos. Stay tuned.